Biological Information, Entropy, Evolution, and Open Systems. We've been discussing the book Biological Information, New Perspectives, which is written or edited by several people, collection of papers uh, published by World Scientific Publishing in 2013. Should have been Springer, but they uh, reneged on the contract. Um, the, it is the um, polished up uh, proceedings of a symposium held in May um, 31 through June 3, 2011 at Cornell University. Uh, and the entire book is available for free um, at the web address shown. The book itself um, can be gotten from various places for uh, uh, well upwards of $100, and that's because it's a small printing and they are all making it available. So those of you who, are, who buy the book are subsidizing all the other people, which is fine if that's what you think. It's certainly what I think, and I bought the book. Um, biological information. The book starts with a general introduction and then biological information and genetic theory, which we are in right now, theoretical molecular biology, and finally biological information and self-organizational complexity theory. The uh, uh, chapter that we're going to work on is called Entropy, Evolution, and Open Systems. It's written by Granville Sewell, who is in the mathematics department at the University of Texas at El Paso. And um, the abstract goes, it is commonly argued that the spectacular increase in order which has occurred on Earth is consistent with the second law of thermodynamics because the Earth is not an isolated system and anything can happen in a non-isolated system as long as the entropy increases outside the system, compensate the entropy decreases inside the system. And by the way, the, the two assertions that are there are actually true. It's just that um, um, the connection between them is uh, somewhat insecure. However, he goes on to say, if we define X entropy to be en the entropy associated with any diffusing component X, for example, X might be heat, and since entropy measures disorder, X order to be the negative of X entropy, a closer look at the equations for entropy sh change show that they not only say that the X order cannot increase in an isolated system, but they also say that in a non-isolated system, the X order cannot increase faster than it is imported through the boundary. That you have to import the order. Um, thus, the equations for entropy change do not support the illogical compensation idea. Instead, they illustrate the tautology that if an increase in order is extremely improbable when a system is isolated, it is still extremely improbable when the system is open unless something is entering or leaving, which makes it not extremely improbable. Thus, unless we are willing to argue that the influx of solar energy into the Earth makes the appearance of spaceships, computers, and the Internet not extremely improbable, we have to conclude that at least the basic principle behind the second law has in fact been violated here. One, compensation. It is probably fair to say that the majority view of science today holds that physics explains all of chemistry, chemistry explains all of biology, and biology completely explains the human mind. Thus, physics alone explains the human mind and all it does. In fact, since there are only four known forces of physics, the gravitational, electromagnetic, strong, and weak nuclear forces, this means that these four forces must explain everything that has happened on Earth, according to this majority view. For example, Peter Yaron in College Physics 1 writes, one of the most remarkable simplifications in physics is that only four distinct forces account for all known phenomena. <coughs> in my 2000 Mathematical Intelligence article, A Mathematician's View of Evolution, I argue against this view, asserting that the increase in order which has occurred on Earth seems to violate the underlying principles behind the second law of thermodynamics in a spectacular way. I wrote, 
I imagined visiting the earth when it was young and returning now to find highways with automobiles on them, airports with jet airplanes, and tall buildings full of complicated equipment such as televisions, telephones, and computers. Then I imagine the construction of a gigantic computer model which starts with the initial conditions on Earth four billion years ago and tries to simulate the effect, effects that the foreknown forces of physics would have on every atom and every subatomic particle on our planet. If we ran such a simulation out to the present day, would it predict that the basic forces of nature would reorganize the basic particles of nature into libraries full of encyclopedias, science texts and novels, nuclear power plants, aircraft carriers with supersonic jets parked on deck, and computers connected to laser printers, CRTs, and keyboards. If we graphically displayed the positions of the atoms at the end of the simulation, would we find that cars and trucks had formed or that supercomputers had arisen? Certainly we would not, and I do not believe that adding sunlight to the model would help much. Anyone who has made such an argument is familiar with a standard reply. The Earth is not an isolated system. It receives energy from the sun, and entropy can decrease in a non-isolated system as long as it is compensated somehow by a comparable or greater increase outside the system. For example, Isaac Asimov in the Smithsonian Journal uh, recognizes the apparent problem. And he quotes him, you can argue, of course, that the phenomena of life may be an exception to the second law. Life on Earth has steadily grown more complex, more versatile, more elaborate, more orderly over the billions of years of the planet's existence. For no life, from no life at all, living molecules were developed in living cells, then living conglomerates of cells, worms, vertebrates, mammals, and finally man. And in man is a three-pound brain, three brain, which, as far as we know, is the most complex and orderly arrangement of matter in the universe. How could the human brain develop out of the prime, primeval slime? How could that vast increase in order, and therefore that vast decrease in entropy, have taken place? But Asimov concluded that there is no conflict with the second law here because remove the sun and the human brain would not have developed. And in the billions of years that it took for the human brain to develop, the increase in entropy that took place in the sun was far greater, far, far greater than the decrease that is represented by the evolution required to develop the human brain. That's the answer. Similarly, Peter Uroni in po College Physics writes, some people misuse the second law of thermodynamics stated in terms of entropy to say that the existence and evolution of life violate the law and thus require divine intervention. It is true that the, that the evolution of life from inert matter to its present form represents a large decrease in entropy for living systems. Notice this is not contested by either person or by most people. Um, but it is always possible for the entropy of one part of the universe to decrease provided the total change in energy pardon me, total change in entropy of the universe increases. Some other authors appear to feel a little silly suggesting that increases in entropy anywhere in the universe could compensate for decreases on Earth, so they're careful to explain that this compensation only works locally. For example, in Order and Chaos, the authors write, in a certain sense, the development of civilization may appear contradictory to the second law. Even though society can affect local reductions in entropy, the general and universal trend of entropy increase easily swamps the anomalous but important effects of civilized man. Each localized man-made or machine-made entropy decrease is accompanied by a greater increase in entropy of the surroundings, thereby maintaining the required increase in total entropy. And I would point out that that's true if you have an internal combustion engine, for example, the increase in entropy uh, caused by burning the fuel uh, uh, drives the decreased entropy of the automobile going up a hill, for example. The equations of entropy change. Of course, the whole idea of compensation, whether by distant or nearby events, makes no sense logically. An extremely improbable event is not rendered less improbable simply by the occurrence of compensating events elsewhere. According to this reasoning, 
The second law does not prevent scrap metal from reorganizing itself into a computer in one room as long as two computers in the next room are rusting into scrap metal and the door is open. Or the thermal entropy in the next room is increasing, though I'm not sure how fast it has to increase to compensate computer construction. And actually, it is true that what we do is we take and de increase the entropy of, uh, let's say, uh, crude oil um, in order to create computers. Consider the diffusion or conduction of heat in a solid R with absolute temperature distribution U, which is a spatial uh, distribution. The first law of thermodynamics, the conservation of energy, requires that, and don't worry about the equations actually, I'm just going to go through them to let you see that there's actually, believe it or not, math and physics behind this. That is, uh, the second law requires that the flux to be in the direction in which the temperature is decreasing. In other words, the hot and cold things come to a happy medium rather than more cold to the cold and more hot to the hot. Equation 2 simply says that the heat flows from hot to cold regions because the laws of probability favor a more uniform distribution of heat energy. Thermal energy is a quantity that is used to measure randomness in the distribution of heat. The rate of change in thermal energy, S, is given by the usual definition. Again, don't worry too much about the equations. They are there. For those of you who are mathematically inclined, they will make sense. Um, after a little manipulation, you get another Harry equation, uh, where N is the outward normal unit on the boundary. And from the second law, we see that the volume integral is non-negative. And so from 5, it follows that S, uh, that should be S sub T. I missed catching that. Uh, in an isolated system where there is no heat flux through the boundary. That is, if you've got a closed system, the entropy in the system has to go up. It can never decrease. Since thermal entropy measures randomness or disorder in the, in the distribution of heat, its opposite or negative can be referred to as thermal order. And we can say that the thermal order can never increase in an isolated system. Since thermal entropy is quantifiable, the application of the second law to thermal entropy is commonly used as a model problem on which our thinking about the other less quantifiable applications is based. The fact that thermal entropy cannot decrease in an isolated system but can decrease in a non-isolated system was used to conclude that in other applications any entropy decrease in a non-isolated system is as possible as long as it is compensated somehow by entropy increases outside the system so that the total entropy, as though there were only one type, in the universe or any other isolated system containing this system still increases. However, there's nothing really special about thermal entropy. Heat conduction is just diffusion of heat and we can define an X entropy and an X order, which is a minus X entropy, to measure the randomness in the distribution of any other substance X that diffuses. For example, we can let U, X, Y, Z, T represent the concentration of carbon diffusing in a solid and use equation three again to define this entropy. Um, and repeat the analysis leading to equation five, which now says that the carbon order cannot increase in an isolated system, or the iron order, or various other kinds of order that you can think of. Furthermore, equation five does not simply say that the X entropy cannot decrease in an isolated system. It also says, that in a non-isolated system, the X entropy cannot decrease faster than it is exported through the boundary because the boundary integral there represents the rate at which X entropy is exported across the boundary. So if you have an open system, the entropy inside has to, com has to be compensated. Uh, entropy decrease or order increase has to be compensated by order, uh, disorder being exported, if you like. 
An automobile that's running and doing useful work has to put out exhaust, which is more, uh, has more entropy than the gasoline and air that the engine took in to begin with. To see this, notice that without the denominator u, the integral in 3 represents the rate of change of total x, energy if x equals heat, in the system. With the denominator, it represents the rate of change of x entropy. Without the denominator u, the boundary integral in 5 represents the rate at which x energy if x equals heat is exported through the boundary, while the denominator, therefore, it must represent the rate at which x entropy is exported. Although I am certainly not the first to recognize that the boundary integral has this interpretation, this has been noticed by relatively few people. No doubt because usually the special case of isotropic heat conduction or diffusion is assumed, in which case J equals minus K del U. And then the numerator in the boundary condition is written as k partial u over partial n. And in this form, it is not obvious that anything is being exported or imported, only that in an isolated system, the boundary integral is 0. Furthermore, entropy as defined by 3 seems to be a rather abstract quality or quantity, and it is hard to visualize what it means to import or export energy. Stated in terms of order, equation 5 says that the x order in a non-isolated system cannot increase faster than it is imported through the boundary. According to 4, the x order in a system can decrease in two different ways. It can be converted to disorder, that's the first integral term, or it can be exported through the boundary, that's the boundary integral term. It can increase in only one way, by importation through the boundary. Uh, we have a question. Uh, could you define for uh, those that are non-scientists the meaning of entropy? For some reason, I forgot what it means. Entropy is a specific measure of disorder. Um, it's a measure of uh, higher probability. Um, you, if you think of, for example, the, the easiest way to explain it is to say that if you have, let's say, nitrogen in four-fifths of a room and oxygen at the same pressure and in the other fifth, that has more order because the oxygen is all on one side and the nitrogen is all on the other side than does a situation where the nitrogen and oxygen are distributed relatively evenly. There are four, far more different arrangements of atoms that will allow the nitrogen and the oxygen to be distributed relatively evenly than there are where you have all of the nitrogen on one side and all of the oxygen on the other. And that is why air doesn't sort itself out into nitrogen and oxygen. That is the same general principle as why when you put a, a cold iron bar next to a hot iron bar and you wait a while, the, the heat will transfer from the hot one to the cold one and reach a, a a happy medium on both sides. There are far more probabilities of different arrangements of atoms in the last setting than there are in the first. And uh, we're talking about you know, billions upon billions of different arrangements of atoms even in a very small uh, set of iron bars. But the math always comes out the same way. And because of that, because of that, um, things tend towards more disorder. Thank you. Um, if you want to think of it this way, it's more probable. If, if for example, you were to, let, let's take a very, very simple example. If you were to take um, 
a, a deck of cards that was arranged from, you know, the ace of spades down to the uh, king of uh, diamonds, let's say, all in order, and then you shuffled them, uh, you would find many, many more different parts of a pack of cards uh, or different arrangements of a pack of cards that did not have that kind of order than you would that did. And therefore, the chances of getting that are very slim. If you take a disordered pack of cards and you shuffle them, the chances of them arranging very nicely uh, from top to bottom becomes extremely slim. <coughs> and really, in any decent order, I mean, let's supposing that you wanted all the aces together and then all the twos and then all the threes, it would be highly improbable. Or if you wanted all of the, uh, um, all of the diamonds to, to begin with and then all of the hearts after that and all the spades and so forth. Um, any order is way more highly improbable than disorder and that's why if you, if you take the cards and, and do things to them that would make them more random, throw them in a pile, switch them around, take and uh, 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 shuffle them several times uh, and cut them, the chances of your actually getting a nice ordered stack are virtually zero. They're so close to zero that I have only heard of one case where it was reported that it happened. And in that particular case, they had actually probably taken out a new pack of cards and shuffled them twice with the luck of the draw being that the person who shuffled them actually sh uh, interdigitated them perfectly. And so when they dealt them around for f every four times, uh, each person got an exact suite of cards. In other words, it started out with extreme order and you didn't really disorder them. It's, it's, a matter of, it's a matter of if you don't try to constrain the probabilities, it doesn't come out the same way. We have another comment back there. Um, in case of an explosion. Just a minute. Uh, there's a guy behind you, and we'll, we'll get you out. Is uh, the term entropy, is that uh, synonymous with uh, a measurement of growth, would you say? Mm, uh, not so much of growth as of disorder. In other words, we're, we're trying to determine whether uh, growth increases or growth decreases. It's, it's not really growth, it's disorder. Just energy? Um, but, uh, but taking the energy and turning it into something that is not um, that is randomly distributed. It, for example, if you have something at very cold temperature, it's, it's at absolute zero, everything is sitting there not moving. And if you had a crystal, you could say precisely where each atom was. If you had something that was extremely hot, then uh, you couldn't say where everything was. That would be much more disordered. If you put the two together, they tend to come to an average where ev everything is disordered, including the, including the. Uh, so it it, ju it represents an unknown entity. Then it represents a measure of disorder. Okay. Thank you. It's like a bedroom before and after a teenager's been in it. <laughs> <laughs> um, we had one comment here and then down there and then we'll proceed. Well, I was wondering in the case of, a, of an explosion, uh, would that create um, order, at least temporarily? That, I'm sorry? In the case of an explosion, say you take a couple different types of chemicals and it explodes, creates one event, you might say, and then after that, of course, that creates maybe just the opposite. 
Well, it, yeah, explosions, generally speaking, although it's hard to measure exactly how, explosions usually increase entropy markedly. Um, I think that's kind if, of if you if, if you have a desk that is all cleaned out like this, this is this is something with a certain amount of order to it. That is, you know, I can move here and it's still about the same height. I don't have to worry about the uh, computers slipping and falling off of it. Um, I wouldn't even have to worry about a marble falling off of it because uh, you, you, because it's nice you have one level surface. You have one chemical chemical here, another one over here, so that would be order. But when you get them together, they go uh, their own order. Uh -huh. But when you get them together, it goes boom, and you have a different order. Yes, there are different kinds of order. There's, there's a lot of different things I can see going yeah. on here. There are different kinds of order, and one of them is heat. Uh, one of them is chemical arrangement. Um, the, the concept of entropy is, is a fundamental one in physics and uh, basically anybody who says they can violate the second law, uh, physicists will simply not listen to them anymore because it's been proved too, too much that they don't, that it doesn't work. Um, go ahead. Uh, just to add to the... Uh, trying to clear up the, the issue here. Uh, uh, the teenagers uh, moving in the room, the bedroom, increase entropy. That's correct. Remember that, that's what we're talking about, entropy. We're talking about this <laughs> decrease in order. You go to the store, uh, you buy food, it, it's well organized there. By the time the food ends up in your garbage can, it's increased its entropy. Um, well, and some of it winds up uh, all in little tiny pieces in your in gullet. Um, and uh, there's, incre there's decrease in entropy there in your stomach also. Yeah. Now, I, I, okay, we have two more questions and then I really should should move on and then uh, maybe we can save some of the comments for the uh, for the uh, uh, after the after the uh, we've gone through the material uh, but go ahead we're gonna so then um, anytime you have equilibrium or a state of equilibrium between any substances that would be like max Entropy. Uh, yeah, it's a state of equilibrium between two two things tends to go to where there is maximum entropy, um, and uh, there is chemical entropy and there's heat entropy, and sometimes the two are are at odds with each other, and so you'll wind up with part of the equilibrium ha having one. Uh, uh, and and you'll have you'll have let's say a, a molecule that can uh, join with itself. Um, some of the molecules will be joined, and some of them will not be. And in fact, if you dilute it, the and the lowest entry or the highest entropy tends to shift towards more uh, molecules dissociated. And if you bring it into concentrated um, solution, the molecules tend to um, come together with each other. A good example is nitrogen dioxide versus dinitrogen tetroxide, which um, spontaneously can split apart or, or, uh, or uh, form together. And if you put them in a more concentrated solution uh, or more concentrated uh, pressure, uh, it tends to form more of the N2O4 rather than the NO2. So uh, it's a general principle that works uh, for anything. Did you need to say something, or we'll we'll we'll, we'll get back to you uh, when uh, when the time comes? I was just going to add that uh, another term would be randomness instead of disorder, and that might make it clearer to some people. 
Yeah. Um, but there are different kinds of randomness that compete with each other. And, and the Gibbs free energy, for example, is ex actually a measurement of the heat-related entropy versus the chemical-related entropy. Um, <clears throat> Stated in terms of order, equation 5 says that the x-order in a non-isolated system cannot increase faster than it is imported through the boundary. According to 4, the x-order in a system can decrease in two different ways. It can be converted to disorder or it can be exported through the boundary. It can increase in only one way, by importation through the boundary. Um, a tautology. The second law of thermodynamics is all about probability. It uses probability at the microscopic level to predict macroscopic change. Carbon distributes itself more and more uniformly in an isolated solid because that is what the laws of probability predict when diffusion alone is operative. Thus, the second law predicts that natural or unintelligent causes will not do macroscopically describable things which are extremely improbable from the microscopic point of view. The reason natural forces can turn a computer or a spaceship into rubble and not vice versa is probability. Of all the possible arrangements atoms could take, only a very small percentage could add, subtract, multiply, and divide real numbers or fly astronauts to the moon and back safely. Of course, we must be careful to define extremely improbable events to be events of probability less than some very small threshold. If we define events of probability less than 1% to be extremely improbable, then obviously natural causes can do extremely probable things. But after we define a sufficiently low threshold, everyone seems to agree that natural forces will rearrange atoms into digital computers as a microscopically describable event that is still extremely improbable from the microscopic point of view and thus forbidden by the second law, at least if this happens in an isolated system. The compensation counterargument was produced by people who generalized the model equation for isolated systems but forgot to generalize the equation for non-isolated systems. Both equations are only valid for our simple models where it is assumed that only heat conduction or diffusion is going on, naturally in more complex systems situations. The laws of probability do not make such simple predictions. Nevertheless, in can anything happen in an open system, I generalize the equations for non-isolated systems to the following tautology, which is valid in all situations. If an increase in order is extremely improbable when a system is closed, it is still extremely improbable when the system is open, unless something is entering which makes it not extremely improbable. The fact that order is disappearing into the next room does not make it any easier for computers to appear in our room unless this order is disappearing into our room. And then only if it is a type of order that makes the appearance of computers not extremely improbable. For example, computers. Importing thermal order into a system may make the temperature distribution less random and importing carbon order may make the carbon distribution less random but neither makes the formation of computers more probable. My conclusion from can anything happen in an open system is the following. Order can increase in an open system not because the laws of probability are suspended when the door is open, but simply because order may walk in through the door. If we found evidence that DNA, auto parts, computer chips, and books entered through the Earth's atmosphere at some time in the past, then perhaps the the appearance of humans, cars, computers, and encyclopedias on a previously barren planet could be explained without postulating a violation of the second law here. But if all we see entering is radiation and meteorite fragments, it seems clear that what is entering through the boundary cannot explain the increase in order observed here. The common sense law of physics. I was discussing the second law argument with a friend recently and mentioned that the second law has been called the common sense law of physics. The next morning he wrote, yesterday I spoke with my wife about these questions. She immediately grasped that the chaos results in the long term if she would stop caring for her home. I replied, tell your wife she's made a perfectly valid application of the second law of thermodynamics. In fact, let's take her application a bit further. Suppose you and your wife go for a vacation, leaving a dog, a cat, and a parakeet loose in the house. 
I, I put the animals there to cause the entropy to increase more rapidly. Otherwise, you might have to take a much longer vacation to see the same effect. When you come back, you will not be surprised to see chaos in the house. But tell her, some scientists say, but if you leave the door open while on vacation, your house becomes an open system, and the second law doesn't apply to open systems. <laughs> you may find everything in better condition than you left. I bet she'll say, if a maid enters through the door and cleans the house, maybe. But if all that enters in is sunlight, wind, and other animals, probably not. <laughs> Imagine trying to tell my friend's wife that provided her house is an open system, the fact that chaos is increasing in the rest of the universe, or on the sun, providing its sunlight enters through the door, means that chaos should de could decrease in her house while she is gone. Even if the door is left open, it is still extremely improbable that the order in the house will improve unless someone enters that makes this not extremely improbable. For example, new, new furniture or an intelligent human. Suppose we take a video of a tornado sweeping through a town and run the video backward. Would we argue that although a tornado turning rubble into houses and cars represents a decrease in entropy, tornadoes derive their energy from the sun and the increase in entropy outside the earth more than compensates the decrease seen in the video. So there's no conflict with the second law? Or would we argue that what we were seeing was too difficult to quantify so that we can't be sure there is a problem? Some things are obvious even if they are difficult to quantify. In Signature in the Cell, Stephen Meyer appeals to common sense in applying the second law to information. Most of us know from our ordinary experience that information typically degrades over time unless intelligent agents generate or regenerate it. The sands of time have erased some inscriptions on Egyptian monuments. The leak in the attic roof smudged the ink in the stack of old newspapers, making some illegible. Common experience confirms this general trend, and so do prebiotic simulation experiments and origin of life research. A recent article by Andy McIntosh, and uh, once you pay extra attention, he's going to be the one giving the next round, in the International Journal of Design and Nature and Ecodynamics, takes a detailed and technical look at the relationship between entropy and biological information, but also incl uh, includes appeals to common sense such as, both Snyder and Bunn calculate by slightly different routes a statistical upper bound of the th on the total entropy reduction necessary to achieve life on Earth. These authors are making the same assumption, uh, that is that all needs, one needs is sufficient energy flow into a non-isolated system and this will be the means of increasing the probability of life developing in, in complexity and new machinery evol evolving. But as stated earlier, this begs the question of how a local system can possibly reduce the entropy without existing machinery to do this. Machines need to be pre-existing to enable an increase in order and complexity to take place. Conclusions. One can, of course, one can still argue that the spectacular increase in order seen on Earth <laughs> is consistent with the underlying principle behind the second law because what has happened here is not really extremely improbable. One can still argue that once upon a time on a special planet called Earth, a collection of atoms formed by pure chance that was able to duplicate itself, and these complicated collections of atoms were able to pass their complex structures onto their descendants, generation after generation, even correcting errors. One can still argue that after a long time, the accumulation of genetic accidents resulted in greater and greater information content in the DNA of these more and more complex collections of atoms. And eventually, something called intelligence allowed some of these collections of atoms to design cars and trucks and spaceships and nuclear power plants. One can still argue that it only seems ex extremely improbable, but it really isn't, that under the right conditions, the influx of stellar energy into a planet could cause our atoms to rearrange themselves into computers and laser printers and the internet. But one would think that this, that at least this would be considered an open question. And those who argue that it is extremely improbable and thus contrary to the basic principle underlying the second law of thermodynamics would be given a measure of respect and taken seriously by their colleagues. But we aren't. Now, my take on all this is a simplistic idea that a scent of the great chain of being is natural. 
I think is a flawed uh, idea. I think a simplistic idea that an open system is all one needs to destroy the argument from the second law of thermodynamics is flawed. I think Granville Sewell has a point here, but I don't think you should expect it to be conceded without a stronger argument, and possibly not even then. Next week, I, we will look at one of those, I think, stronger arguments. Part of the question is whether an argument is evidence strong evidence or reasonable proof. Uh, of course, nothing except mathematics is absolute proof, and maybe not even then. I can give you one example. Um, legally, uh, the way they phrase it is the preponderance of evidence, clear and convincing evidence, and proof beyond reasonable doubt. Uh, this argument from the second law is, in fact, preponderance of evidence, I think. But one thing to keep in mind is there's no way the other side is going to give up their religion based on this kind of evidence. Any more than most of us would give up our ideas based on something that increases the chances of uh, uh, either mindless evolution or uh, long ages um, being true uh, from 50% to 60% or even from 50% to 90%. Um, most of us would say it takes a little stronger evidence than that. Uh, it would take at least clear and convincing evidence if not um, proof beyond reasonable doubt. But that's my take on it. Now it's your turn. We have a comment in the back that's been waiting. And uh, it's, uh, Leonard, can you give it to uh, Doug? And then, uh, and then you can have second. OK, is go there, ahead. Is there perchance a, um, a, law, of the con uh, a law of conservation of um, entropy, where as for every adult that becomes more responsible, there must be a child born to balance the uh, entropy. <laughs> well, uh, probably not in that direct way. Uh, it seems like, uh, uh, depending on the adults, it might even be that for every adult who is irresponsible, there becomes a child. But. <laughs> Anyway, yeah. um, quite a few years ago, there was a lecture here, I think in this room, by Dwayne Gish. Um, and the faculty challenged his, the way he used this second law of thermodynamics in relation to evolution. And out of the discussion, there came a list of four things needed to um, decrease entropy. And I, I've never heard a better explanation of it yet. And that is, you to, to, to deal with this question of entropy in relation to evolution, you need four things. You need input of energy, and that comes from the sun. You need plenty of energy. Well, there is plenty. You need an energy conversion system uh, and, a, and a method to control the energy conversion. Okay, and that's photosynthesis and the control mechanism. Right. If you've got that, then fine. It, it, open system is helpful. If you don't have that, open system does nothing. No, and in fact, I think that that's uh, next week we'll, uh, we'll discuss, but we might as well just, uh, we can discuss it here now that what you're looking at is in order one of the one of the things that's going to be absolutely necessary is a machine that is to say something that will deliberately couple increasing energy on one area or entropy in one area with decreasing entropy in another area without those machines uh, sending more energy is more likely to, to disorganize things than it is to actually make them better and I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I think that that is one of the missing pieces. And I think that if you ever use this argument, you need to, you need to at least get into that discussion. Because if you don't, uh, I think that your discussion is incomplete. We increase entropy in certain things all the time in order to decrease entropy elsewhere. We burn lots and lots of coal in order to 
turn iron oxide into iron? Um, You know, we, we burn fuel to warm the house. Uh, we want the, but more importantly, see, warming the house is actually increasing entropy, so that's not, e that's not hard. What is interesting is we burn fuel in order to generate electricity, in order to run pumps, in order to pump uh, heat outside of the house, so that the house, as a non-closed system, actually has less heat and therefore less entropy. Um, and what happens is that the outside air gets hotter. And not only does the outside air get hotter, but the air down at the, uh, uh, at the generating station gets hotter and contains more carbon and hydrogen combined with oxygen and less free oxygen. So uh, there's a number of different ways we decrease the entropy somewhere else in order to get increased entropy where we want it. But that doesn't happen on its own. You have to have specialized machines that enable you to, to evaporate Freon in one area and cool everything down and, and to condense it in another area and release heat. Well, that's just the point. You're kind of going in circles because uh, photosynthesis is a machine. That's right. So where did that come from? It seemed to need something of that sort in order to get it going somewhere else and changing it. So that seems to imply that you have to have a designer or something there before all this took place that we can't explain. So this is not explaining much of anything. Yeah. Well, I think that that's one of the questions is, can you get a machine without a designer? Yeah. What machine? Um, you Thank scientists you. are making it too complex. The media has told us this week that comets provide both the seed and the water for life on Earth. That's done. That's it. So something came through the door? <laughs> Somehow, I think that the, um, that the claim that life came from comets is going to be really difficult to make unless you actually suggest that it's bacterial spores. But, but they would have had to come from someplace else, no? Exactly, exactly. That um, is exporting uh, order and then importing it again. Uh, it's surprising to me that they keep raising this issue of life when they're looking at this comment. Do these folks have any idea how complex life is when they make these statements? I, I just don't understand it hardly. But it's, it's a mantra out there. And boy, we're going to find life because we know life can arise, arise fairly easily since it did on Earth uh, type of thing. Uh, uh, the scientific community needs to get a short step up a little bit if it wants to uh, win respect of thinkers. Well, you run into the same problem with Mars. You know? Exactly. Mars is supposed to have life. Titan is supposed to have life because it has water. Uh, you can go down the list of uh, Europa has water and therefore must, must be, uh, we must be able to get life out of it too. So um, let's go and see if we can explore and find some. Uh, it's, I agree with you. I think it's a total misunderstanding of how difficult that order is to come by. Uh, yes, and then here. Um, our tendency to expect uh, solutions merely by input of energy um, seem to have certain pitfalls even in human relations. Uh, we sometimes have even social structures that are set up for the application of power in order to bring about solutions. The problem with that, and so we end up with all kinds of totalitarian regimes whose ideology is sufficient power solves all problems. Uh, the problem with that, as we all have recognized with, with so many failed experiments, is that power is helpful if power or deficiency of power was the problem. But if the problem was 
inadequate understanding, no amount of power can make up for that. And the problem with inadequate understanding is that understanding is an issue of a different order. We're dealing with information at that stage. If we don't understand the issues properly, how can we solve them? You know, and there are problems which we don't know, and there are problems which we don't know that we don't know. And such problems cannot be solved until we have a whole new level of information that's needed in order to address them properly. And no amount of power from the sun or from some kind of supernova can ever be adequate to solve that. Yeah, or well from whoever. <laughs> what you need is understanding. You need information. And information is an entity of a completely different order. Uh, uh, I shouldn't even use order. I should say category. Yes, it's a category so mistake, if it's you a, like. It's confusion of categories. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and confusing categories in this way uh, makes one think that one has solved the problem without ever having addressed it. Yeah, this is a really fascinating discussion, and we can all relate somewhat to it, even though it's complicated at times. Um, what we're dealing with here is basic reality. How is the universe put together? And another thing that we're dealing with, are there exceptions to reality? Unreal things and events and causes and effects and something that doesn't work right. Now, yeah, we call it corruption. <laughs> or we, we think there's uh, bugs in the system. <laughs> That's right. Anyway, um, to go a little different direction than the discussion today, when you think of one aspect of reality is time. What is time? And philosophers have debated this ever since Aristotle and probably before. Time has an arrow, so we call it time's arrow. We cannot reverse time. No human being has ever reversed time. Yet, when we're dealing with something like this, entropy and so on, we're dealing with a process that overall is irreversible. So we're dealing with two fundamental realities. One is time and one is matter. And both of them are leading in certain directions. Well, the interesting right. thing is that uh, there are people who will say that the second law of thermodynamics defines time. Mm -hmm. That is, the future is, the aura, is, the, is, is increasing disorder. I'll have to think about that for a while. I have a comment down here, and then I guess another one next to it. You know, it, finding truth is not just a rational, reasonable uh, approach, because uh, Scripture speaks of people willingly ignorant. And uh, it's a love of the truth that spares uh, people from the, the faulty thinking of uh, our world today. Uh, yeah, yeah, I just... Well, uh, it's, it's very interesting. I, I, who is it? I, um, I want to say John Updike, but it was one of the, one of the 20th century or 19th century uh, novelists that, that uh, made the comment that it's very difficult to get a man to understand something when his livelihood depends on his not understanding it. <laughs> and um, uh, I, would, I would generalize that to say when his, um, uh, when his continuing to do what he wants depends on his not understanding it. And I have, I have watched this process, in fact, go in, uh, in the opposite direction, where you realize that if you concede this, then you have to concede that, you have to concede that, you have to concede that, and eventually you have to go where you're not going. 
And so what will happen is you'll actually back up the chain of reasoning to where you will deny this point, and pretty soon people will start to deny, for example, that there is such a thing as logic with the law of the, unex uh, of the excluded middle and with the law of, uh, of non-contradiction. Uh, it is bizarre how far people will go to protect their, uh, their, their own personal little uh, goals. Yeah, tru truth really takes humility uh, of mind. Otherwise, you know, we all have that pride of opinion, and once we state, make a statement, you know, just people want to back that up uh, with just their life on the line. Well, I don't think it's uh, it, I, pride of opinion is one of them. I've I've st said if I if I say I'm wrong, then then there, then there's something wrong with that. Most of us can eventually get over that. I think what the real problem is is that. Um, is it's pride of what we want to do, um, and and the pride of opinion is is just a small part of that. That uh, you know, if if I do not wish to acknowledge, uh, let's say the Sabbath, then I find myself. I, well, there must be some reason why the biblical uh, evidence is wrong on this score, and it and it. And it backs up into, well, you know, um, Moses didn't know what he was talking about, or maybe it wasn't even Moses, or, you know, there was no Bible. It, it's, it's amazing how far back that chain can go eventually. Um, if you don't want to surrender your, your, your life to, if you don't want to say you're wrong in your actions, that's not pride of opinion, it's really pride of, of action. You know, I'm, a go, I'm an okay g a guy. I really, you know, I haven't done anything wrong. Well, that means that when the Bible says that you need to repent, I must be talking about somebody else. Or it didn't know what it was talking about. And then you find different ways of discrediting that uh, information. So there is this, you know, this inexorable logic that keeps going. I'll give you one other example that's really classic. Um, the, the denial of intelligent design as a scientific subject comes from this very kind of chain of events. And I've demonstrated in a number of times uh, where w what's really happening is we will not have a God. And if we admit that there is it looks like the designer did that, and that's a fair inference. Then, w you know, um, uh, aliens really don't quite cut it. And so we're going to be forced into the idea that there is, in fact, a god of some kind. And so we, don't, and so we will deny that there's any evidence for design. Because if there was true evidence for design, then it would just, uh, it would, it would, that's where we would go, and we're stuck with it. Um, and so you will find people who know good and well that there's plenty of evidence for design and that uh, designers are possible, um, deny that design is even a, a scientific subject. And at, and at the same time, when you get them quietly away from their fighting views, You'll get them to say things like Richard Dawkins said, who, who said, well, that's an interesting subject as, you know, the origin of life might have been from uh, some kind of designers, as long as those designers are themselves evolved. You see, because what he really doesn't want to go is f it, once he concedes design, he knows where that's going. And so knowing where that's going uh, when he's thinking about it will have him deny the obvious. Because I'm just not going there. Uh, just a minute. Uh, actually, we have a comment here that, that was next. And did you have a comment as well? So uh, go ahead and then there, and then we'll get to you. I'm sorry, I'm trying to give other people a chance to. 
Go ahead. Okay, if I may just add what is probably a footnote to what's already been said. Uh, early in your presentation there, the point was made by whomever I forgot that physics explains chemistry, which explains biology, so that ultimately physics ends up explaining everything. So you, what you have with physics then, or the hard sciences, is some sort of theory of everything. Now, once you accept that ontology, then you have an epistemology, which in fact uh, naturalists invariably accept, which is that any cognitive enterprise can only be a valid one if it's science, or if it uses the method of science. Now, Th the problem that's true. That, yeah. I mean, if you start with those, that, those premises, that's the conclusion you come to. Yes. Now, I, I submit that that's a self-stultifying position for the following reason. I know of no science that can tell us that, because epistemology itself is not the business of science. I don't know any science that's interested in the question of what constitutes genuine knowledge, or how we come to know it all, or any of that sort of thing. So and how would you do in a controlled experiment yeah, on that? Yeah, exactly. So to claim to know that science affords the only authentic knowledge, the naturalist has to go outside the perimeter of science to a point which can't exist if that premise is true. So which means that they're philosophers whether they like it or not. Yeah, and the, but they're self-stultifying philosophers given that yeah. premise. So the assertion that science is the only valid cognitive enterprise doesn't show up in science, it shows up in a meta-narrative which can't even be written if that premise holds. Yes, although this, uh, the scientist who used that will use it without realizing that it is a meta-narrative. It's, 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 it's just, um, uh, from, from their point of view, this is one of those unquestioned um, assumptions. Yeah. My question is a little different. Um, I'm going to be having my 27-year-old grandson and his wife at my house to eat. How can I tell them what this thing we've talked about means to understanding of creation evolution? Well, well, here's, uh, okay, the, 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 um, uh, one, of, one of the reasons that I go over this is because there are people who use the second law as a way of proving that creation must have taken place because otherwise you couldn't have gotten order into the system. And I'm saying that that is a, as it is stated there, it is too simplistic to be able to bear much weight. So I guess one of the things I would say is don't use this argument as a, as a killer app, as a killer argument. This side. is not the silver bullet. This uh, is actually more like a plastic bullet. It won't even kill. Um, um, it's kind of interesting. It, it, it goes against the, the, the grain to go there. But what happens is that the argument that would be used as a counter argument is, but we see in nature that things have gotten better with time. Because you look back in the, in the Precambrian and there's little, you know, algae. And then you look in the Cambrian and there's all these other things and then as time goes on, why the ladder goes up and up and up and gradually we get to men. Or people, of course. All right, <laughs> all right. <laughs> um, uh, and, uh, and that's, I mean, that's the way the argument goes. And so they say we have empirical evidence that this argument is not true. And frankly, if you're stuck, if you're doing the, that kind of an argument, um, you, may be, you may be right about it, but the evidentiary value is so weak as to not be helpful. And so I, I advise you not to use it as a plain argument. Now, if you want to argue that the only way we can do this is by machines, which is what we're going to cover next week, I think that you can make a better argument 
is that you need the machines ahead of time in order to convert, uh, uh, in order to get a decreased entropy in an area. And where did the machines come from? Do machines ever spontaneously arise? And that makes it a little stronger. Okay. Um, if you want to be really strong, uh, then what you want to say is, and look at here are the parameters of these particular machines, and you can see how chance is not going to get you from one machine to another, let alone create a whole new machine all by itself. And we can show that different species have brand new machines in them. Mm -hmm. And so that takes intelligent intervention. The second thing that will help is to destroy the argument from, you know, the Precambrian to the Cambrian and so forth by saying all of that stuff except for the Precambrian was actually laid down at about the same time. And so the progression argument really won't fly. And that's where things like uh, paraconformities, soft sediment deformation, um, uh, the, the showing that some of the stuff that was claimed to be laid under land is actually under water, um, the showing of massive currents all over the globe that shifted from one way to another, uh, that would be paleo currents. Uh, the finding of carbon-14 in coal and dinosaur bones, the finding of those kinds of things in uh, 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 I want to say, I'm trying to think of what I want to say, the uh, uh, blood and osteocytes and stuff like that in dinosaur bones. Uh, that's where those come in. And what I'm saying is, you know, use the, if you use this argument at all, use it very carefully and, and not putting a lot of weight on it because it won't bear that much weight. Okay, and I didn't, I don't understand it that well myself. <laughs> Yes, and that's one other thing, and that is that if, you know, if, uh, if I'm a physician, I know that I don't know everything, and there will become some things in, in urology or cancer uh, treatment, oncology, or um, in general surgery, that I will call a colleague in and say, can you do this? I can't. And I think it is perfectly legitimate to do this in uh, theologically related uh, areas, too. You don't know what's, uh, you know, well, can I introduce you to my friend Ariel Roth? Can I introduce you to my friend, you know? Uh, they understand more about these arguments than, than I do. Uh, and, and that's a perfectly legitimate thing to do. Or, or to study with somebody. That's what we do in, in Bible studies. We're willing to, to say, hey, let's pull out the Bible. This is some areas that I know about. These are some areas that I don't know about, and we study them together, and we come to conclusions. Um, if we do that in, in the area of Bible studies, certainly we can do that in the area of science. So if you get into a discussion and it goes over your head, just say, hey, this is over my head, but uh, talk to somebody else. But at least now with this, you have some kind of a picture of the general subject so that you don't use this as a clobbering device, but you might use it as a kind of a question to leave something inside of them to ask, could this have some evidentiary value? Maybe what I'm doing is not completely, uh, it, maybe, there, it, maybe there, it isn't totally overwhelming that uh, that the, the, the evidence is on my side. And I think that that's probably as much as you can use it for. I would simply, I would simply say uh, to, to your son, uh, you had an excellent example of the extremes to which some scientists would go to try and answer science without God. Had a good example here, the, the argu argument of the open uh, earth or open universe, sometimes they use different levels of openness, uh, is an excuse. It's an excuse which does not hold up 
in front of probability at all. Uh, you start applying uh, statistical rigor to, is it possible that there's a designer and there isn't? Your designer is going to win hands down. I, if I could leave one thing that I think that this guy does in, that was worthwhile bringing this chapter, besides, besides to say be careful about using this argument, it would be this, that you have to import order from the outside or else you can treat it as a closed system. That simply shining sunlight isn't an adequate excuse that you're going to have to have something inside the, either inside the system or outside the system that is somehow creating order from uh, disorder. And that basically means some kind of machine. And we'll go over the, that in a little more detail next week. Well, we will see you next week then um, and uh, continue the subject.